Carolina, and I met a retired uh, nurse, ar an army nurse, and she was raising canaries, and she had all her little things set up in different rooms in her home, and, and she's the one that educated me about canaries, because this was a little bit before the internet, and a little bit before all this information being easily accessible online. And so, it was from her teaching to her telling me to look at your birds, watch your birds, and so what to do if and when, that I learned about people. So, before I even got canaries, uh, like you want to do before, uh, you just uh, go into people, people like right and left. Cats, you just dogs, cats, livestock, making the around. I researched. I read and read and read and read. Um, some of the, the pet shop books that I read uh, were not quite as on the. This is, this is the true way of eating canaries. It's really, really all about. They kind of fluffed it a little bit. I will say, and I'll pass this around too. I found this book by a canary breeder who's bred canaries all her life. And you'll see there's no pictures, nothing for attention to people like myself to get carried away with or distracted by. It is really good, to the point, factual. I mean, just here, this is how it is about keeping canaries. And I, I'm going to pass it around so you guys can see it. Um, so I dabbled in mostly, um, here, here, just my term, mud canaries, are crosses between this type of canary or this color canary, and so it's all hobby for me. I do belong to the St. Louis Canary Book Club, I learned a lot from master breeders, and these are people who keep, who have Hello. bird rooms outside the house, who have the I don't have the I don't have the bird, and bird, and I don't have the all masks, I go to the nationals, um, I'm not at this level, but I am at the level of keeping birds for howdy, fun, and a little bit of fun, because you know, I, I enjoy sharing, uh, oh. keeping oh. the areas. I also have uh, 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 I don't know if I can pass it around, but I will uh, just give you a big idea of what's You're coming right back. So this poster, are you looking at your color red? This is kind of what's happening in the people who are really working with and doing breeding uh, with canaries. So here's one color poster. Here's another one. Let me get that one for you. Here's another color bread. So you can see there's just, and it's like, what, what do you mean yellow? So you've got yellow and tints is what, what those are. But it's just amazing of what, and this isn't, um, so this isn't all of them. There's more being developed as we speak. And here is probably your typical tight canaries. And we'll talk about this in a minute too. So we'll, I don't know where in the world to put these, Georgia, but I'll kind of lay them around somewhere and you guys uh, go through and take a look at a later date. We'll find them. Maybe I'll put them up by the Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. I love cartoons, yeah. Bugs Bunny, so walk over to Huff Huff Bug. You are so here he is. This is the original wild canary. This is what a wild canary looks like. You see the greens and the yellow hues. Um, and so what happened was, back in the early 1700s, 1600s, our Spanish sailors, started sailing. this is where they're from, uh, Canary Islands area. And I think, to take one more step back, I think to a bird like this, uh, it's important to know this history and the research and the things that have been done about these kind of birds, because they're a lot of like our little house sparrows and our partners that we see around here. They act a lot of like, very territorial, very, um, they are to like. When I start building my nest, laying my eggs, defending, brooding, raising babies. Can everybody hear me? I'm rather soft spoken. Okay. Would the, when the parrot stops, would that help? Okay. So this is where they are this is where they're originally from. And from there, we are Spanish sailors. Got, uh, captured birds, 
took them over to Spain, took them over to Europe. They started, the monks got a hold of them, started raising them, uh, sold only the males. Does that sound a little bit familiar? The only males were being sold. And of course, the nobility and uh, your wealthy people wanted these, and so the prices went up. Does that sound familiar a little bit too? And so, drove up sort of short supply, and soon, it, it didn't take long, hens became available. And, uh, and uh, people started bringing them. Same thing happened in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they started hunting uh, birds, the wealthy got them, and then next thing you know, you are folks who weren't the wealth, upper, upper wealthy class, but they weren't you know, poor, had to work for everything they had, from that middle class. That's the people who got together with some of your upper class in, in Europe. We're talking 16, 1700s. And that's when some of your type canaries started happening. They started doing selective breeding. It was like, oh, I like that song, I like that song. So we put those birds together. Well, I like that shape, I like that color. Just like with our dogs and our cats, how we selected and breeding them to get the type. Same thing with canaries. I added this slide. Does anybody know what this canary is? Yeah, it's a yellow. They, they, they look like the little goldfinches. They do like goldfinches. This, this is the London Fancy Canary, which was very popular before either both wars. And so I kind of put this slide up to show what happens when things fall apart when you're working with and you have hobbies and war. A war breaks out. Uh, so they lost this canary. Uh, it's been gone for several hundred years. Um, like in some poultry and livestock, some of that, we lost it. However, we had a little bit of stuff being written down, and so we've got the makings of the London fancy coming back. And so they got the, um, I would say, maybe the ingredients of how to produce a London fancy. And so there's one um, that's not, uh, that's 20, 21st century bird. <coughs> Yes, they are probably going to be. So before I really get into talking about and this whole starting this blah blah blah, why don't you guys talk to me just for a few minutes? Um, how many have a canary? Great. How many is it just a canary, one male, enjoy singing? Good. Your breeding canaries. One or two or more pair. More pair, two or more pair? Maybe one? One pair? Two, three, pair? Two pair. Two pair. Great. How many are thinking about adding a canary to the flock and household? Okay. Oh, well, that's great. They're thinking about it. Okay, great. Okay, good. Um, because what's going to happen is once you um, learn a little bit more about keeping a canary, it's going to decide on how many you want to keep. All right? So. Um, so we have, like I showed the posters, there's three main types. You have your colors, you have your type, and then you have your style. So of course the color, and I put in princess the, the English spelling of color, because a lot of your, most of your text you're going to come across by Peter Canary are your English writers, and so it's going to look different. What you may see here, what we see a lot and I see a lot, are the brown, brown wolves and red pastures and some of your yellow and tents. And so, how dare I put a poster on the side like that? They're right here, and so when we get a chance to walk around and look at them, I want you guys to take a few minutes and look and see what's out there. So here's an exa some examples of some of really high-quality, color-bred canaries. You have the red factors, the yellow tint, some of your brown um, gold, and then you have some of your mosaics. Those are kind of like that's some of the things that uh, are out there, really almost real easy to get your hands on, but you're going to have to pay for them. It doesn't matter what, do some of them you have to speak, feed special diets to to keep their color? Yes. So there is red factor yeah. um, dye that you would feed it. You can do it dry or liquid, and your yellow and tint things. Um, that's a good question. I, I'm not going to go into real detail about color feeding and I what for show quality birds. You do, there are some birds you will color feed. You'll need to color feed your uh, red factor birds, some of your bronzes, and some of your uh, Stratford canaries. Uh, I think even your um, Norway. Color fed. I, I, that's, a, that's another whole talk, okay?
Okay, can we save that for next time? I don't know what time we have. <laughs> That's a good, okay, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> So you are typing here. Some that I see in Tracy Carey here are from Border, Fife, and Gloucester. I see she, every now and then she gets some of those birds here. That poster is right here for us for you guys to look at a little later. Here's some of the more, uh, so you got the border canary, just a, a no. nice, beautiful, soft, feathered, brown canary, like a baseball with a head and tail. Uh, the Gloucester uh, has a corona, and then the one, the, uh, the ones without is called a consort. So when you breed Gloucesters, you put a corona with its consort. You never put a precious or it's called a, it's called a um, corona, or in the hearts it's called a crest. So you never put two corona birds together. That gives that legal gene. So with the Gloucester, you put consort with crested, and you'll get half and half in your blood. The bottom is your five, which is a minute, which is just a minute order. And then your givers. I mean, that's you got to love that canary to keep it. Uh, it's very, very interesting, and uh, I've never, I've, I never seen that. They actually stand like this. Very bolstering look, I think. Thank you. Those and, the, and your borders, that, from what I've noticed, that's your show keeper birds. That's people who breed them for actual showing. It's not that you just have to obtain one. Uh, you go to national bird shows. Um, it's possible you can come across some of those for sale. Um, I've heard uh, show uh, master breeders haggling over bird show quality birds, and I've heard the price 500 and up for birds. So it's really amazing. Um, but that's nothing compared to you guys. That pay probably for these birds. Here's a few more: the lizard, the Norway, and the Yorkshire canary. Um, that's a very tall. The Yorkshire is a very tall, military, militaristic standing. Uh, long canary. The Norwich is kind of a round, they call it sometimes the bull canary. So it's got this feather that makes it like a looking hard at you kind of And the lizard is the oldest uh, one. I think I've read it's the oldest canary that started in captivity other than the original wild call. And there's lots of rules around keeping and breeding uh, lizard canaries. So they have a little cat that's on their head. And they're, and they're called lizards because their feathers resemble scales of a lizard, and that's their pattern. How it became to be a type bird and not a color bird, I, I'm not sure. That's everything I'm, I, I'm reading and being educated myself on. They're, they're a type bird, not really a, a color bird. But they're silvers and there's reds, and you have the color feed those for show. And breeding them, you want to breed a full cat or a broken cat. So again, that's another conversation about how to do some of those things. So our song canaries, I think this is the area where we're most familiar with because we want a canary that's going to sing. So I've seen Tracy um, bring in the Spanish Tombrado, the Mallers, and the Hearts. Um, that used to be uh, what folks used to call the kitchen canary long, long, long time ago. Um, water slaughter yeah. and the American singers. So the American singer obviously was created in America. It's just a little short TV commercial here. And a group of women in the 30s said, let's create a song canary that's from America. And they got together and talked a water type canary with a roller canary. And with some fine tuning, they came through with the American singer. And as you can see, American singers can be any color. So it's just not um, red for its color. It can be, there are uh, shape dimensions that you want it to be, but when you show a uh, American singer canary, it, they're not looking at its color. They're listening for its song. And so years ago, I got the chance to sit in on a judging and all these little show cages, you know, they're about this big, about this wide, and it's very temporary for them. It's probably for the day or two for that canary. And they're all covered up. And when they're ready for 
rich canary to sing, they uncover it and the band that the canary starts to sing. And so all the points are awarded for how fast it starts singing, some trills and some notes. I don't know all the requirements, but that's what the American singer um, has become now. So probably, probably, when, when you get them from Tracy, probably it's, um, it can be a muck canary, crosses between this canary and that canary, or some American singers. They sing real loud here. It, it varies, and so it can be a nice mellow, nice rolling sound like the roller, or it can be a high shrill sound like a fife. Um, it, kind of, it, it kind of depends. I have a couple now who is a heart. I have a male that's a heart and a fife cross, and he I can hear him all over the house. And then I have a little male that is a fife, and um, his father was a fife, and his mom was a white man, could have been an American singer, and he has a soft, uh, very soft, um, but strong song. And so there's always there's differences with those songs. It's not just one loud, non-stop song. There's lots of variants and personalities, too. Do they change their song while they learn a song from another bird? That's a good question. As an adult, they may add to it. It's when they're chicks. Uh, for example, water slogger. You want them to sing a water slogger song so you don't house those young males with American singers. And, or you'll play a water slogger CD for them to learn. So that's a good question, too. Yeah. So let's get in some details. I gave you a little bit of history. I think it's important to know where they come from, what's out there. Um, so let's talk about. Um, uh, breeding, uh, foods and treats, cave location, and safety and taming. So, canaries are very territorial. So if you're thinking about getting a canary, your male canary will be happy all by himself. And in his cage, which we'll, we'll get to, with his divider taken out, be just, amount, just the right amount of room for him. If you're wanting your canary to come out and fly around your house and you have a selected room in your home, that's possible too. And so that takes a little bit of training. It's, and it's not hard to do. There are, they have little brains, but they learn little things a little bit at a time, and then it becomes a routine. And like all of us, we have routines. When we get our routine, it's easy to like, oh, I do this, and then when it's time, I go do this. That, okay? So keeping more than one canary. You do not want to house two males together. They don't like it. They'll fight because they are territorial. It's like putting the Incredible Hulk and Stallone together in a two by two. Okay, they're not going. To... So this, if you're if you want to break an area, this, this is beautiful. Look how neat that nest is. A canary hen and birds can build a nest that I don't think anybody can replicate. Little baby in there. Yeah, before you get to that, that, was that, was that built around the basic cup? That's a basic cup mix, and I'll get there in a few minutes, quick So, before you can get to that, you've got to have this, right? So, a little insert on sexing. So, telling my canary apart. If it lays an egg, you got a hen. <laughs> Probably can DNA um, test them. She writes about this, Arthur. I really enjoyed this book. And this author writes about people who keep who kept canaries who are master breeders, sell bird, young birds, or like, I think that's a male, he's doing this, and I think that's a hen that's doing this, and they get them to get them home, and it's quite the opposite. So you need to give a male canary almost nine to 12 months before you really, really know you have a male canary. Because your hens are going to do a little singing too. They're going to do a little. But the male, you'll be a little bit different. You'll hold his head up and you'll see some throat action. See how that, see how his throat is kind of, his feathers are stuck out? You'll, that's what's going to happen with your male. But with your hens, it's not going to happen. I've bought males, uh, hens, being, being sold as males. And you got, I got them home as a young bird. And she, and she said, turtle, turtle, turtle. I said, oh yeah, she's just coming right along. And then she's tearing paper and she's laying eggs. And so 
that, that was it. That was all the uh, singing I had. Yes, ma'am. What, what age did I become sexually mature? A year. Yes. So if we catch canaries out early this spring, the following spring, that hen and male will be ready to be How long do they live? In captivity, up to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a well kept bird. So, also at the breeding season, you can vent sex. Your hen's uh, vent area will start to swell, get ready for eggs, and your males will stay about the same tubular, brown, tight. Um, I'll, I'll also share, looking at this slide, some of your uh, breeders who breed the bigger birds that are really soft feather will cut feathers from around the vent. Um, that's to make sure that, um, that when they breed, everything connects properly. But doing that um, takes a little bit of practice. But there's some feathers around the vent you don't want to cut because it's a guide, kind of a guide system. Um, but for the birds that if you want to purchase here, your hearts, your fives, you don't need to do that. They'll, they'll do it. They'll make it. Um, maybe not all the eggs will be fertile. Four out of five or three out of four or all three. We're doing good. Yeah. So this is an example of this, is an ideal setup. So because canaries are so territorial, your male may come into position before your female will. And if I put them in this cage together, they'll fight. But she's not ready, she'll have nothing to do with it. And so that's why that divider's in there. And what you can do um, is you put your male on one side, he's starting to sing, sing, sing. You, you divide it up, and you put the hen that you want to breed with that male in here. And so they're both, she's safe, they're both safe, and he's going to go bonkers and just sing, sing, sing for her. When she comes in condition, and the signs of that are, um, I'm pulling papers, um, you put some nesting material, and I'll, I'll show this in a few minutes, in there, and she's starting to carry uh, stuff around, and she's twirling with it. Um, even if you put your nest basket in, and she starts building a nest, that's a good sign she's ready. The best sign that it's okay to put them together if he's feeding her through this a little wire panel. So he's going to feed her. And that's your best sign that they're, they're okay. So when you take the divider out, you just leave the room. No, you sit and watch and you keep an eye on them for a few minutes and make sure that everything's going to go okay. So that is the best ideal setup. So what I've done, because really nice pages. I'm, um, I got the 32 inch, so what I do is this little sliding door here, I'll take one of them off and put the next one real close to it, and so it's only one layer, and I'll, and I, then I put my two birds together, and then when they're ready, I just open that door, and if she flies, when she flies into his, I'll just, that would be the breeding cage. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, it can easily be done that way as well. So you have to set up a I do. Yeah. Also, I have I only have three breeding pair right now, but I've had more, I've had less. And sometimes because they bond so well, and when I put them in flight cages, I just you know I put my males and females all back together again. They have plenty of room. Yes, there are some squabbles, but that's just like they are in breeding time. I've never had a real aggressive mean male, which is good, because if you do, he's in a cage by himself. It's just how it's going to be. Um, and that allows the birds to stay together. It's easier on the, the keeper, one big long flight cage to clean, of just fewer waterers. And I also like to put the same pair back together you know, when it's time to breathe. Um, I, because I have so few, I, I don't want to breathe, which sounds good. So when I when a clutch is hatches out and you're putting that male with their father with one of the mothers or a son with one of the mothers, it's called angry. And a lot of you show canaries do that. I, I'm not into showing canaries, so I don't I don't mess with that. But I'll put the same pair together. Um, when I was being taught about canaries from the lady in Chapel Hill, she talked about her canaries actually being in love with each other and when she separated, they just call, call, call for each other. Even when they're in side-by-side -side cages, they would just fly against them. They would just fly from one corner to the other corner trying to find them. Yeah, put them back together and everything just so...
Canaries have personalities, and they they'll have. So best practice is you separate your males and females during um, off breeding season. Some uh, my sure. Oh, okay. So some of my birds, some of uh, the uh, master breeders I know who have bird rooms have have sort of these cages set up but are in kind of boxes and they can pull all their slides out and create almost like a 12 to 18 foot slide cage and they can house four or five males because there's lots of room in there and when they're not in the breeding season males they they squabble but it's not like when it's uh, time to breed. Does that make sense to you? So this is the ideal startup situation. Um, I like these. I also found some of these online um, because when you hang them up, of course you're hanging these up here like that, and this will hang like that. And I found that when uh, the baby canaries poop, um, you know, you always get poop here. This will just fall all the way up on the bottom and clean up to a little things here. Um, I, it's sturdier, and I like this because when I go in to take the nest out to um, check on chicks or eggs, um, it's, it's just easier for me because I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm so heavy handed and trying to get this back on there is a little, a little difficult. But um, that, that's two. And within those, you'll need some of these non little pads. Um, when I ordered these, they came with a little um, insert. Uh, I had to tape it down because the end would play with it and pull, and next thing you know, it's Turn it up to the side, but bottom of the cage, and you may have to kind of like tape these down inside. Because what will happen is all that wonderful nesting material will slip, and I've, I've had a couple of hens I've had to kind of take the cage, take the nest out, and push the stuff back. So the cup will go back down to the bottom. So that's that's important. Talking about nesting, what I found my canaries like is the uh, sisal. They love to build the nest with it and then line it with, and Tracy carries this too, it's like a cotton thing. And I've gone to the wild bird shop and got some things so they can have an assortment of stuff to what they like to line their feathers with, uh, line their nest with. So here's a question. Do you know anything different about the eggs? Yes, exactly. So the canary's last egg is a brighter blue than her first several. So most of the time you know she's done. doubling almost daily. And so that first chick, and you got three days, or the third day, that little chick is so tiny to get its head it, it won't be out. Yeah. And so I have I have because I could I didn't get to the clutching time and I've lost the, the last egg is the egg you want to lose sometimes. Room temperature is fine. Yep. Um, Correct. So, if you, yeah. so if you think about your wild birds, even your ducks, who 
lay a clutch of like 20 eggs or 12 eggs, that hen's not incubating until she's done and she starts. And the first egg happens at the same time the last egg is done. That's absolutely, absolutely amazing. I, I got this picture uh, too for a couple of reasons. That's absolutely adorable. But so when you candle your eggs, when you, so when you raise parrots, you take you, you check your eggs, right, for fertilization. Yes, no, sometimes. I check about after a week. I'll um, I have a, uh, an egg candler. I'll take the nest out. <coughs> the dark room. And I do this at night, uh, right at the evening most of the time, and I'll candle the eggs. So if I have a clutch of four eggs and one egg is not fertile, I'll probably leave it. Because uh, as the chicks hatch out, see how he's resting on that egg? It helps get through because what's going to happen, their little heads are so big, their necks are weak, it's going to just go right straight down. It's a lot of energy to go all the way up and get that head up. So, um, good advice that I, that's been passed along with me is um, just leave that unfertile egg in there. When all the chicks are hatched out, they got a day or two, then you go in and take it out. So that way they're getting their heads up. It's kind of like I, I got a pillow in my in the nest to help hold my head up. Does that make sense to you? The canaries who lay lots of eggs, like six, they start laying six. Um, four is a good rule. Four eggs for any uh, bird. If her first year, her second, or her third year, uh, five, six eggs is a lot of babies for a pair of canaries uh, to. Uh, to raise. It's been done. Uh, or you can foster them out. I have, every now and then I have a hen that's um, after about third, fourth, fifth year of age, the hen, that's it. They're not going to get a very reliable hen as far as breeding and hatching out. But she's an excellent mom and she'll build a nest and she'll lay this weird size egg and but it's not going to be pearl. Uh, use it for a foster. Throw some um, Mother your canary eggs underneath her and let her raise uh, one or two chicks. Morning, yeah. Correct. Let her hatch the eggs. Yes. So housing. I think housing has changed um, since our Victorian uh, forefathers have started keeping canaries to what we're doing now. We've moved about the bird being. Um, uh, the pleasure of keeping a bird has moved from uh, happy and, com uh, and comfortable. So this is a bad example. <laughs> no matter how cute it is, a bad example of what a uh, canary cage looks like. And all of these are great examples. Oh wait. <laughs> So with any bird, a finch or canary that you're wary of letting it out of its cage, of course the more room it has to fly, the happier this bird is going to be. Canaries uh, need length more than height, and they need to exercise their muscles, most, especially the hens, because when it starts the breeding, it starts and they've been in a nice long uh, flight cage and you put them in this, um, they're flying kind of this cut hatch. So she's going to need good muscles to help uh, lay those eggs. Um, the top left one, that cage is great. The only, the only downfall about that, setting that cage up, is the perches are wrong. And it's nothing that I don't think Tracy or Varieties does, it's just how they come. Um, you take those long perches out, and then you'll get some things, you'll get like this. And I recommend these because, and these, and this is okay, but I'm, we're going to change the location, direction. Because the canary uh, gives it um, different sizes, things to clutch to. You know, we run with the same hand all day long with our hands, like, ooh, give me something big or something tiny. So in this cage here, this is going to be my cage. I was going to house my male canary. I would give her these cups. You won't need them because uh, they'll they'll waste food. The canaries are messy. Um, if you're a neat freak, a little like me, um, you you want want to. Um, 
you'll find other alternatives. And Tracy carries some really nice stuff to uh, help keep seeds and things together. What you want to do to give a canary its maximum flying room is, and I got this backwards because I got to get into it, is you want to be, the bird to be able to fly from left, from one side of the cage to the other side of the cage. And so to maximize that is giving purchase there far apart. I mean, ta-da. Um, and occasionally, you Put one down here. Something like that. But I, but I would recommend you the different size. So go with something like this. Um, even, even your wood dowels that will go all the way across, that's okay too. So something that went all the way across is good. But you want flying room this way. And when it comes to seed and water and cuddle bone and all those things, um, I'd recommend this for a canary. Canaries love to bathe. And when you put your water in a dish like this, it's going to take a bath every time. And then it's drinking bath water. So this for drinking. And then uh, once or twice a week during the non-breeding season, offer it a bath. Now my birds love to get in. You can get uh, the Cool Whip containers, fill it half full, they'll get it in, I mean, water will go everywhere, you'll have an indoor fountain. Um, this is a good size, I, it's okay, I would recommend something bigger, bigger. I've even put these in there, filled it with water and they get down in there and you'll, and they love it. And then they'll go to their perch and preen and do all, all kinds of wonderful things. Cold water, don't use warm water, don't think it's going to, oh, they're going to get cold. No, 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 they're not. They're not as fragile as you think they are. So give them some, just run the cold tap. You don't need ice water. Uh, run the cold tap, put it in there, and let them, let them do their thing. They will love it. I like to set up um, stations for like your mineral. You'll need some, your grit and your cuddle bone. I like to set it up where all that's like together. I don't know why I did that. It's just how I did it. Um, and I also find the little cups that you put in, like this, when the, when the bird comes down, even if there's a, a perch in front of it, or if it lands here, that bird's going to turn around, and then it's going to poop. It poops in everything and everything. Um, and so you're changing. I've tried uh, the grit and some of these waters and some of these little feeders, and that's working out pretty good. But uh, sometimes once they get what they want, the good stuff is up here, and, and they're not able to get to it. So. Um, I've done, I've experimented, I've gotten the uh, little terracotta things you put under flower pots and I've sprinkled their seed, you know, put some treats and put some stuff in that, but again, that's maximum a day and a half too, because again, the poop, they're going to land in it, walk around in it, but they are ground feeders, and so it is what it is, they're not going to eat their food, but um, um, I like setting up little stations where they go and get the perch and their cuddle bone, their, all their little and, um, things like this. This is a uh, calcium trace mineral. I, that is there. I give mine prime and, and I offer this. And I read and follow, the, um, read and follow directions. It's all there. So I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. So let me talk about this kind of stuff. Food, anything that's fortified, Tracy carries everything you need to keep the canary <coughs> fed. All right. Um, I will share. I, I'm not very crazy about the Zoom cream, the, the pellet stuff. Canaries are a seed eater. Uh, finches are seed eaters, and as a treat, go for it. But as their main source of, of intake, I would stay with seeds. I would really recommend it, unless your bird that you purchase is totally on Zoom cream. Then you keep it on Zoom. But if you get a eating seed, stay with seed. Okay. So with that year round, um, I get my prime to follow directions and everything. Almost everything they need is in this to maintain health. Even uh, it's not a water soluble. It's a uh, you sprinkle uh, maybe your kale or top of your seed or top of the egg food tree. You sprinkle on top of that. It'll kind of just fill you in. Wonderful. And if, if, 
I keep this um, at whenever they want it. This is the mineral grit. So I keep this whenever they want to go to it and get some that's um, available to them all the time. This, you can do two ways. This is the essential um, calcium. I add this during breeding season because the hens need more calcium to help form their eggs. Okay? So I just put a little bit more extra than just the cuddle bone because this, this is a calcium source. And then they get this. And I'll just put it in a cup and they can access it like they want because she knows how much calcium she needs in her body. This is um, an egg food. There's two ways you can do this. You can get it to them dry or you can moist it down or you can add boiled, a mashed boiled egg to it and mix it all up. Add some of your prime to it and that's what they can feed their chicks. So let me talk about this for, let's talk about that for a few minutes. So, I, by profession, I'm a school teacher, and so I have spring break. Fortunately, this year, I had lots of babies hatching out during that week, and I was able to do my egg food. I would put a little bit, just enough what they would eat, and feed the chicks for maybe a maximum an hour. Because I'm scared of spoilage. You don't want bad, bad food in there feeding your chicks. So if now that, you know, coming to the end of the school year and coming going back to work, I would put this dry right into a cup and they would access it. It won't go bad. They could have eat, they didn't have it all day long. What is that? What kind of this is an egg food. Egg food. And there's several different kinds she, uh, Tracy carries. Um, so another thing, see, there's so much, guys. <laughs> another thing, too, about this kind of stuff, you don't want to start feeding the canary when they have chicks. So, hmm, let me see if my canary will eat this. You start this a little bit as a treat to see if they even eat it. And then it's like, oh yeah, they're eating it. Okay, good. And so it's a treat about once a week. And even while they're she's sitting on eggs, it's still considered considered as a treat. Keep their um, their uh, high their, their food coming to them regularly. Kale is the best green thing you can feed them. Um, and I'll stop there because we you can lettuce too much lettuce gives them runny. You'll have watery because there's lots of water in lettuce. And if you feed your chicks that, their food is just running through them. So kale, you can feed kale to your birds every day. So canary can eat kale every day. Yes. Daniel Lyons also, wounds and leaves are good. Yes. Wash, wash them, come out of your yard, wash them real good. Yeah. So, um, so, I lost my train of thought. Come back, I'll come back to me. Yeah. You can do that year round. You can as a tree. Yeah. So that's where I'll work. So when the chicks hatch, they have access to this 24/7. Even after the chicks are starting to fledge, that's something you want them to have access to. Another thing you can do too is soak seed. That's something else you can try. Um, I did it when I was home on spring break, so I could take it out and change it like I like I wanted to, but. Um, that's something too you have to manage kind of care. And they really, really like so they're 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 really good at that. Are you gonna are you gonna be talking about molding? I can, yes. yes. So this is something what I've done. This isn't a picture of my house. This is a picture I found like, oh, somebody's thinking the same way I am. So I took two hand me down cages, took this part out and made me a white cage. You know, so to reuse, re um, <coughs> Use your pages that way as well. So, molting. Okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things I wanted to find out what you guys wanted wanted to know. Um, yes, they molt. Of course. <laughs> Most times, right after breeding season, they'll go through a molt. Um, I sometimes I will add in the uh, liquid iodine that. Uh, Tracy carries here, just put it right in the water. And, yeah, and that will help um, feather development and growth. You know, uh, extra protein is not necessarily needed. Um, treats, the song food, and all those kinds of things, they're really nice. Uh, once or twice a week kind of thing. All right? Um, they don't, uh, canaries uh, have simple wants and needs. They don't need a lot of uh, extra things. Uh, what they really like is their, their seed. Um, I, 
I, I can't recommend this enough. Uh, this author talks about a study that was done on kept, kept birds, now parrots, and the and canaries, and the biggest deficiency was their vitamin D because we have our birds inside. And so that study said, our birds, make sure you have uh, a good source of, of vitamin D. <coughs> Toys. Um, occasionally, I'll put something like this in for my uh, for my fledglings. Canaries don't need toys. They, if, you if I had a canary, what he would need in this, I'd probably add a swing, and that's it. No mirror, no reflective stuff. That's stressful because they think it's another male canary. I'm gonna fight you because you're in my territory. Okay, um, and that's how uh, that goes. A couple other things too uh, with hands building nests. There's a couple of things I've used. This goes on the outside of the cage. You put stuff in there. Or you can um, get this little wheel, and it just pops open. You put your stuff in, you close it, and then you attach it to the side or to the top or down to the bottom. A couple of things. Um, with this, I found I like attaching it to the top, but, but making sure my perch is high enough. If I did this to the side, I found that my canaries were started roosting on it. And when you roost on it, what do you do? You get food. And so that, that means you're taking it out. Or you can put it down low like this, and that'll work too. If it's too low, I'd rather be up high. Canaries, uh, most birds, high, I'm safe. Um, and so it kind of deters from the person. If you get a canary, and you think it's a male, and, you, and it's, oh, I have a hen, she's going to lay. You can't stop it. Uh, and what triggers laying is the length of the day, kind of like our songbirds here. Um, this author, and, and my experience is you let her build a nest and let her lay and let her set um, under those unfertile eggs. Because if not, if you take them, she's just going to keep laying and keep laying, and that's going to keep her resources because she is, um, it takes a lot of energy more energy to create and lay an egg than it does feeding chicks. That's where all her canary hen does. And the other thing you can do is to keep her to, uh, so that when the eggs are, when eggs, bad eggs, as they dry up, will lighten up and the hen notices that, she'll come off the nest and then she's laying again again soon. You can put a few dummy eggs because it takes about 14 days for a canary egg to hatch. And after about 14 days, just take the whole thing out. Um, some, some things that I've been said to help take them out of the nesting is uh, from master breeders or feed them cucumber. We'll, take, we'll put them into a, oh, I don't want to lay anymore, I'm, I'm done, kind of thing. Another, other folks, uh, what they've done is put them in their flight cages, uh, and if they're still in laying, they'll lay in their seat cups, they'll lay here and there, but they'll soon very quickly start, stop, I mean stop. And the other thing is to help promote a molt, for help promote a molt, uh, is to pull a feather or two from the tail. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, the last resort kind of thing. You pull a, a tail feather or two, that, and it helps, it helps trigger the molt. Uh, yeah. Okay, I've talked a lot of <laughs> Okay. Um, Okay, so what questions might you have? What did I did not talk about that you were just like, oh, I can't believe you didn't talk about How long will the molt last? Um, looking at four, maybe four weeks at the most. Um, some canaries molt, you, you'll have feathers almost all the time maybe. Um, it's not a, I drop everything, I look like the you know, baked chicken. It's not that, it's a, your tail feathers and your wing feathers will give you the best indication when they're all in, the most times they're done. And when you're, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a gradual thing. And you'll notice their first molting will start on their wing shoulders. It'll look like they've been plucked, but it's not. They'll start molting here first, growing in new feathers. Yeah. We know during the molt, our male, we have one male carry. He's not finished. Yes. And I think he's either finished or very close to being finished. Well, no, that's, that's one of those what if my canary didn't stop singing. Okay. Okay. Give it time, the only thing I can think of. Um, 
Because this is maximum, this is at the maximum height soon of uh, wanting to come and see this. The length of the day is what creates that need to sing and, and breathe. So if he has outside access to sunlight, if he has open windows where he's kept, that'll help. They're very sensitive to light. Does, does it help with hearing? Give them a decreased life cycle? Yes. So, mm -hmm. what, what is the optimum reading what the optimum is to get them out of breathing? Because the parents is like 12 and a half to 13 hours of bright light versus to, to get them out of that, take it down below 12 hours or at least a maximum of 12 hours of darkness. Correct. It's about the same? It's about the same. And so, what I'll do now, my birth, I, I let my birth finish up. I have hands under. I let hands do only two clutches a year. Um, even even if it's just one chick, one chick hat, one buzz, that's it, no, there's no more. <laughs> and so um, I decrease the light, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll start decreasing it and matching the light to come on about an hour, sometimes 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour after the sun's come up, and they'll go off probably about an hour or 30 minutes before the sun goes down. So that way I give them um, kind of a natural kind of decline of the day. If you're really, if you're in a room where, or if you'll keep birds and you're really going to do lots of breathing, um, I would, I would recommend going researching and finding out because uh, some of my uh, colleagues will keep uh, dimming lights because this white light will go off, but this dim light will still be on, and then after so many times, that light will go off, and it seems like the night light is still on, and so in, in my bird down where I keep my birds, uh, I, I keep the night light on 24. Seven during the breeding season, because when the lights go off, um, if the hens off the nest, you know, chilled eggs, chilled chicks, they're, you're done, you're going to lose them. But there's just enough light that they can get back on the nest, and if something happens in, in the night, there's just enough light that they can tell between night and day, but there's enough light for them to be able to see. However, if you're keeping just one or two canaries up in your, in your uh, study or something like that, you have access to indirect bright light, I would let um, the birds do it naturally. Your season will be different because my, I started mine early February, um, and we do that because that's why I was, so I was trained to do. Um, the other thing was your, by the time it's time to show birds, your young chicks are ready to show in October. Yes, ma'am. What did you say uh, you should feed uh, the molting season? Uh, I put liquid iodine in their water. Liquid iodine? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if you have some canaries or even fish with bald spots and it's like, ooh, they molt and they just come back right or something, and they're still bald, put some liquid iodine. Um, you can also add some sea kelp to their seed as a treat. I'm going to grab her, then I'll grab you, okay? Our windows today are coated to keep out the UV light, mm -hmm. so you can't really rely on that unless we're going to open the window and have it through. That's that's a good point. Um, you can there's uh, lights you can put like over your yeah. aquariums, and then you know, that will mimic the UV light as well. Yeah. I'm gonna grab her and I'm gonna see you Yeah. Can you put liquid iodine? If I've got a little lineated parakeet. You've got like a little ball spot on the top of its head and it doesn't seem to be getting it. Would that hurt her? Him or her, I don't know which. Um, I, I'll answer that with, if it's uh, a bird supply that's sold for birds, I think it would do the same thing. Read and follow those directions. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say with the uh, UV lights themselves, they are effective. They are effectively giving good UVs for only about three to six months. Right. So don't don't. They are very expensive balls. Don't but don't plan on leaving them until the bird bar itself turns out. Because after the first three months or so, they're not really giving off UV properly. So you have to think in terms of changing them a lot before they. If you're using them for a sole source of light, and they have to be relatively very close to be effective. If you've got good vitamin D in your food source, the primers, they are able to produce their own calcium from the food and the prime, and the UV lights are not as necessary. But if, as long as you're feeding a proper supplement, you don't have to have the UV lights. 
Yeah, just a little extra. UV light can be dangerous for your birds too. Too much of it, too close. Too wide. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't want to go to the end of the bird. I don't want to get frazzled. Mm. But, and I don't know anything about the small birds at all. But I live somewhere in the same area. And like, you were mentioning that if you can see them fly around the room, that's something. But I read something somewhere that said if you tried to catch them, that they could actually be scared to death. Well, you know, little teeny brain, little teeny heart, just panic sets in. You know, you're, you're, yes, that, that is that is possible and it can happen. Um, to train, I, again, we have access to a great resource, YouTube, training a canary to fly out your cage on, on um, a whistle or a bell or you know a command of some sort is really easy. You just you do it with a tree. And what you Another thing is when you get ready to set your room up for your birds to fly around, close windows or create something that it's going not going to fly into. Um, put places out for it to land. Put things out it's familiar with. Um, sometimes these little tree perches here. I know they're for parrots, but you can mimic those in, in your house with um, a tree safe a tree safe branch or a perch that's familiar with. Sometimes you um, I put a dish with a tree here for it to fly to, and you can start with just looking at the cage, putting this, uh, attaching maybe something like this, and putting this tree out here, and it's coming out. That's that's step one for getting your bird out of the cage. But you don't want to handle it. There are some people who do hand raise their canaries, and, and they'll sit on their finger and come to you. That's, that's another talk too. But, um, like, canaries aren't your handleless birds, or, and they're not the lovey-dovey, well, I need attention from you all the time kind of birds, um, but they like the attention. It's, it's a nice, really nice balance when uh, one has to work so much, and then you, you love a speaking bird, and you come home, and there it is, singing. You know? So um, it's a nice balance between that.